When it came to looking to voice this list, I feel like in this introduction I need to set a few ground rules. Because while everybody loves a bad guy when it comes to the medium of films, we have to make a clear distinction that I am not saying here with the examples we're going to be covering today that I fully support all of the villainous things these villains have done. Because let's face it, they cause suffering, they cause pain, a lot of emotional turmoil and do some horrendous things in their time on the silver screen. I am not saying that these are people we should idolize. In fact, it's the very opposite. However, sometimes a special kind of villain comes along and kind of wins over our hearts, presenting us with a message or a mindset that deep down at its core holds some root of truth that we then attach ourselves to while watching. And it's in taking that message and doing things in the wrong way that they become the villains of the piece. So long story short, we can condemn these people while also finding their messages compelling. So let's take a look at them today. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 movies where you want the villain to win. Number 10, Joker. The Joker has a long and storied cinematic history, with acting heavyweights like Jack Nicholson and Heath Ledger taking iconic turns as the clown prince of crime. In 2019, the excellent Joaquin Phoenix stepped up to the plate to give us a Scorsese-flavoured take on the iconic villain in Todd Phillips' Joker. After making a name for himself in comedies for nearly 20 years, Phillips examines the troubled clown for hire, Arthur Fleck, and what social circumstances led to a tragic figure such as this becoming the Joker. Arthur's inevitable, violent implosion occurs after he is unjustly vilified by his fellow comedians, then abused by a system that is meant to be helping him and generally treated by society as somebody who doesn't matter. Now, The setting of the Joker is a thinly veiled version of 70s New York, a time of extreme crime levels, social deprivation and violent upheavals. The film forces us to question how we would likely act in the shoes of Fleck, living in such a pressure cooker day to day. Now, He is not totally sympathetic. I mean, does brutally murder a few people after all, but Phoenix's performance elevates Fleck's character into something recognisably human and worthy of your empathy, at least until he quite literally pulls the trigger. Because up until that point, you truly feel for Fleck as he has the worst day of his life every day of his life. Number 9. Training Day it's no surprise an actor as charismatic as Denzel Washington made this list as he is utterly magnetic in whatever he puts his hand to. And one of his most iconic roles was that of Alonzo Harris, a corrupt cop tasked with training a new police protege, Jake Hoyt, who is played by Ethan Hawke. As the eponymous training day wears on, we see Alonzo casually engage in all manner of dirty deeds, ripping off drug dealers, antagonizing ex-cops, and even murdering a few people along the way. It's clear to the audience that Alonzo is the real villain of the piece, an unstoppable force of charisma and corruption. So I ask you, why do we root for him? Well, to put it simply, it's down to Washington's blistering performance and the director's dedication to showing the character honestly warts and all. We, as an audience, may wish for him to slow down, but the issue is he's just too much damn fun to watch. Even the unhinged choices Alonso makes in the third act, as well as putting Hoyt in grave danger numerous times, there is still a part of us that wishes for him to somehow make it out of this mess alive. Alas, but rather fittingly, this is not the case. Number 8. Silence of the Lambs The Hannibal Lecter franchise has had its fair share of ups and downs with even the TV adaptation being brilliant but then deciding not to be in its final season. Michael Mann's Manhunter was an excellent thriller that didn't make good use of the character and Hannibal Rising failed to give us a worthy origin for our cultured cannibal, but it was Silence of the Lambs that gave the world its first taste of Anthony Hopkins' inimitable Lecter and, to date, it remains the character's best big screen outing. It makes it even more amazing that Hopkins only needed 17 minutes to achieve this, 17 minutes to serve up one of cinema history greatest villains. The Silence of the Lambs is a testament to the power of good writing and an excellent performance. Hopkins was a scene-stealing force of nature in every sequence he was in, and despite his uh, troubling dietary requirements, his sheer suaveness and intellect gave the impression that he actually shouldn't be locked up in the first place, but only so that we, the audience, could maybe pick his brain some more before he decided to eat a bit of ours. His daring, gory escape in the third act of the film feels more than earned. Having outmaneuvered his captors, the FBI and the entire state of Baltimore to do so, it was kind of difficult not to punch the air when he made his triumphant getaway before remembering what he is and what he does. Number 7. The Third Man 
The moment Orson Welles as Harry Lyme appears in the shadowy doorway of 1949's The Third Man, we were all enthralled. The British noir classic focuses on author Holly Martins, who's moved to Vienna at the behest of the mysterious Lyme, a supposed friend with a job opening for Martins, only to discover that Lyme has perished in a suspicious accident. Or has he? Lime is a conniving, selfish person whose slow burn reveal of impropriety has us turning more and more against him. That is, until the legendary humans are like ant speech, wherein this traitorous character lays out in no uncertain terms his view of the war, capitalistic society, and humanity at large. This depressingly nihilistic outlook on life sparks a sense of sympathy for the jaded Lime and grudging admiration for his candor in the face of death. Does it diminish the heinous acts that he's committed? Absolutely not. But do we want to see him perhaps survive the situation to go on to witness better days? Maybe. Full of devilish twists and turns, The Third Man is a stone-cold classic of noir cinema that only cemented Wells' status as a living legend, despite appearing in only roughly half the movie. Second only to his performance in the seminal Citizen Kane, Wells flourishes under Carol Reed's deft direction, giving us a villain to hate for all the right reasons. Number 6. Falling Down Falling Down is a pinnacle work in a long line of regular dude implodes due to the injustices of modern society flicks. Following Michael Douglas as William Foster, who snaps in a hot LA traffic jam, we follow his increasingly violent odyssey across a boiling hot Los Angeles to reunite with his wife and daughter. Falling Down cleverly frames Foster as an everyman hero for much of the film, a man of principle and courage rallying against the evils of contemporary civilization, be it standing up to gang violence, decrying the treatment of poor people or even violently protesting the bureaucracy of fast food menus. Here, in these moments, Foster feels like a living embodiment of karmic justice. But as the day wears on, Foster becomes increasingly more violent and we begin to doubt him. It's not until the reveal that his wife is actually his ex-wife who has a restraining order against him and that Foster lost his job months ago that we realise that our hero actually snapped a long time ago. With the police now aware of his antics and hotly pursuing him, there's really only one way that this ends for the character. Whilst he is justly vilified by the film's conclusion, it's hard not to feel an iota of sympathy for a man whose life fell apart so completely in just a matter of weeks. If anything, we wanted Foster to survive just so that he could receive the help he so clearly needed. And his final realization that he's actually the bad guy in all of this? That is pretty tragic stuff. Number 5. Collateral Returning to Los Angeles for this stylish Michael Mann crime thriller, Collateral follows a hitman, Vincent, who forcibly hires a cab driver to lift him from hit to hit. Less of a paper trail than Uber, I guess. This nocturnal masterpiece stars a very on-form Jamie Foxx as said cab driver and a brutally efficient Tom Cruise in a role so against type that he's virtually unrecognizable. Frequently cited as one of Cruise's best performances, if not the best, the eponymous hitman, while at first devastatingly charismatic, becomes harder and harder to relate to as the film progresses. The problem is, is that Vincent is just so unbelievably good at what he does, and as such, we kind of form a grudging respect for the character. Vincent gets into dangerous situations amongst gangsters and crooks, even somewhat seducing a jazz musician that he loves into telling him stories, despite the knowledge that he'll have to murder him too. It's all the more impressive when our killer seems to make it out of every scrape virtually unscathed. The nightclub scene in particular is a masterclass in set-piece filmmaking. Despite a fatalistic view of the world and killing people off a list like he was just doing his weekly shop, Vincent is professional and persuasive. Through Cruz's immaculate performance and man's wire-tight direction, we're persuaded that Vincent deserves to somehow make it to morning alive, but only with the caveat that Fox's character does as well. Number 4. Cruella Attempting to lionize the puppy-murdering maniac Cruella de Vil was an interesting move on the part of the House of Mouse, but it's one that seemingly paid off in 2021's Cruella, reframing the character as a class upstart in the British fashion scene amid the 1970s punk rock movement. This version of Cruella comes complete with earnest intentions and a rather tragic backstory. The audience witnesses young Estella, played by a fittingly quirky Emma Stone, as she is orphaned at the hands of some rabid Dalmatians. It is a rather groan-inducing reference, but uh, it's still there and kind of works, and then becomes a street criminal and effectively begins a meteoric rise in the London high fashion scene. To become the immortal Cruella of the film's title, Estella's actions become increasingly grey throughout the story, even beginning to alienate her childhood friends and criminal compatriots Jasper and Horace. Despite this troubling transformation, though, we still root for her, as we know that Cruella is as much a product of tragedy 
empty and a broken society as she is the avatar of all of Estella's talent and intelligence. Plus, the killer soundtrack and the bonkers costumes definitely help as well. Number 3. There Will Be Blood Quentin Tarantino accurately surmised what makes cantankerous oilman Daniel Plainview so compelling in a 2009 Sky Cinema interview. The 15-minute opening is non-verbal and utterly mesmerizing. Watching this man break his leg in the pursuit of oil only to crawl on his belly for many miles to receive help and reimbursement shows us Mr. Plainview is no ordinary man, but one of singular grit and determination. Cleverly placing this sequence at the beginning of the film, as Tarantino puts it, gives the character a carte blanche for the bottomless pit of greed and ambition that follows. It does help that Daniel Day-Lewis is giving an arguably career-best performance here as well, which is no small feat given the British-Irish actor has rarely put a foot wrong in his whole career. Whether antagonizing his own deaf son, screwing over an entire town, or straight up murdering an exuberant priest, Plainview stops at nothing to thrust himself on the throne of an oil-soaked empire. No matter how many milkshakes end up being drunk, it's truly compelling stuff to witness, a fact further compounded by the greatest actor of a generation firing on all cylinders. Therefore, we don't actually want him to win overall, but it's just so compelling that we kind of want him to never stop. Number 2. Avengers Infinity War The moment Josh Brolin's big purple wrongdoer strides onto the screen, soft-spoken and sinister, we know we're in for a treat. The Russo brothers summed up Infinity War as essentially the Thanos movie, and the structure of the plot definitely supports this view. He gets much more character development and screen time compared to many other Marvel villains, as well as managing to gain all six Infinity Stones and wiping out half the universe with just a snap of his fingers. Whilst plenty of people on the internet, particularly the type of people who should probably go outside more often, support Thanos' genocidal outlook on intergalactic overpopulation, his plan really doesn't make a lot of sense. Wouldn't the universe just return to this supposed population threshold after a certain amount of time? Couldn't he use the literal infinite power of the gauntlet to make the universe, I don't know, twice as big? Or simply ensure that there would always be enough resources to support sentient life? No, we're just going to kill everyone. Cool. Fine. But you see, Thanos is still so compelling. Maybe not for his character, but because we desire, as an audience, to see something totally unpredictable happen in a Marvel movie. We'd spent nearly a decade watching our heroes defeat various villains over and over again, and despite the general good quality of these adventures, the format was becoming fairly obvious. To see a charismatic antagonist like Thanos actually manage to defeat the Avengers, well, it rewrote our expectations of the Marvel movies going forward, and thus cemented Thanos' iconic status. And number one, Heat. Yet another Michael Mann film that masterfully juxtaposes interpretations of good and bad, we follow expert bank robber Neil, played by Robert De Niro, and his merry band of thieves as they plan their next big heist. Throughout the plot, we see them meticulously planning, avoiding capture and locking horns with flawed super cop Lieutenant Vincent, played here by a twitchy Al Pacino. Much like Vincent from Collateral, we form an honor amongst thieves kind of respect for Neil's bank robber as he conducts himself so carefully and professionally. You'd think that he was like some sort of doctor or a lawyer rather than a consummate criminal. But it's the legendary diner conversation between himself and Lieutenant Vincent, however, that confirms our love for this villain. They relate to each other on their worldview and the tedium of everyday life, and we get the distinct sense that in another universe, these two opposites would have actually been the best of friends. When the grudging respect of your on-screen rival is ever gained, it's impossible not to root for De Niro and company, as they attempt to pull off their heist casualty-free, abiding by a strange but honorable criminal code of ethics. A true masterclass in character work and well worth your time if you've never seen it. If nothing else, just for that diner scene. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 movies where you want the villain to win. I hope that you enjoyed that, and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below. As always, I've been Jules, so you can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero, or you can swing by Live and Let's Dice, where I do all of my streaming outside of work, and it'd be great to see you over there, my friends. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. You, my friend, listening to this video, you should never treat yourself as a villain. You are the hero of your own story, and I want you to know that, that you deserve love, happiness, and success. But if you can, do me a favor as well as to yourself, and go out there with love in your hearts and start building bridges instead of burning them. Because together, as a society, that is the only way that we're going to be able to move forward. Big love to you, my friend. Now take that love and pass it to yourself and to your neighbor as well. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye.